most. The uh, bathrooms are open. They're marked, men, women. So don't go in haphazardly. Don't go in just looking around at all the progress anymore. The women's bathroom is the women, and the men's is the men. So, yeah, yeah. So it is distinguished now. Uh, also, the ladies' day that's coming up at uh, Jan Sanders, um, the schedule's in the foyer, and it's correct. I believe that uh, something in the bulletin was not jiving correctly. So look at the flyer if you got any questions in terms of times, and uh, the, the flyer is correct. Uh, how's Roy doing? Anybody got an update on Roy? I just saw in the bulletin they're going to be looking at him a little bit further in terms of his uh, pneumonia. Good. Okay. And they're, they're thinking about why he's Okay. Very good. Good news then. Keep Roy in your prayers. Um, and Judy as well. And I was giving this to Johnny Baker. Carla Cantrell's mother is in Cox South. They took her yesterday and she's got atrial fibrillation. So an irregular heart rate beat. So if you'd keep her in your prayers as well. Anything else that needs to be added? Who? Okay. 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 We'll keep her in our prayers as well. Jeff? Uh, Johnny? Baker, Carla Cantrell's mother. Con uh, Carla Cantrell's mother, Johnny Baker. Anything else? Okay. Very good. Uh, Jeff, do you mind to lead us in a word of prayer before we begin, please? Thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have to be here this morning. We're so grateful to have this time to come and to study from your word. Father, we pray that you'll be with those who are teaching the classes this morning, Brother Dan and the others who have studied and have prepared lessons. We pray that you'll be with them as they present these lessons to us, and we pray that you will be with us as we are uh, listening, and we pray that we have the correct attitudes and, and, and mindset uh, to receive this this word. Father, we know that we have many that are not with us. We mentioned a few uh, momentarily or just moments ago and we know that there are many more. We just pray, Father, that you would be with them, help them with their, their physical needs. If it is your will, let them be returned back to their much wanted health. Father, we pray that you'll be with those who are traveling away from us we pray that you'll give them safe travels and again if it is your will let them return back to us father we pray that you'll be with those who are spiritually ill please help them to realize their their needs and, and please let something be done said that they would understand the, the necessity that they need to return to you before it's everlastingly too late Father, we're just so grateful for the, the many things that you bless us with, especially this country that we live in. We just pray, Father, that you will be with us and, and not let us to uh, take our, our freedoms for granted. We, we know that there's many places throughout the world that does not enjoy these freedoms. And we just pray, Father, that you will help us to know how blessed we are 
Father, we know that there's many that are taking your, your word throughout the world this morning. We pray, Father, that you will be with them. Please be with their families as they are doing so. Give them the strength and the courage that they need to, to stand up and, and to spread, spread the gospel, even in, in places that are not so accepting. We pray, Father, that you'll be with those who are protecting our freedoms this morning. We pray that you'll be with them and, and again, give them the, the strength and the courage that they need. We pray that you'll be with their families that they're separated from. Father, we're so thankful for those who uh, give their, put their lives in, in harm's way on an everyday basis for, for us, those policemen, firemen, first responders, doctors, nurses. Father, we're, we're just so, so thankful. <clears throat> Again, Father, we're, we're grateful for this time. We pray now that you will be with us and help us to, to focus on, on this message that we're about to receive. We're so thankful for Jesus and his great sacrifice for us that we could have our sins forgiven. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins and help us to overcome the temptations that Satan puts before us on a daily basis. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Appreciate that prayer. If you would, turn to the book of Joel. Uh, that's where we'll pick up on our study, the book of Joel. I'm going to present this one just a little bit different than we did Obadiah. <coughs> Uh, we'll actually just read through it. It's a, it's a brief book, uh, three chapters, but uh, I think it'll make more sense uh, just reading through it and, you know, going over each section. There's, I probably am not unique. The, enri the enriching part of the study of the minor prophets is I'm not unique, I don't think, because when I would read Joel, I would read basically Joel chapter 2 in verse 14 in reference to Joel's prophecy of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that marking of the day of Pentecost. But I really hadn't in detail studied Joel. And the enriching part of this is that it's a beautiful book that's written about a great deal of hope. It's really hope. Now, when we start reading this, as if, you, if you've read and prepared, it doesn't start off that way. And it starts off with very much doom. It's a book written of doom and the circumstance that Judah had found herself in. And in between the doom and hope, is a lot of um, enriching, helpful insight into how we can change our lives so that we find ourselves acceptable. And from that standpoint, that's what I say in terms of, as I've studied in the past, that's not really been something that, that I've pulled out. But it's there, and it's there for us to, to consider. So Joel uh, was written about, I'm going to say, 850 to 830. It's very early written, uh, prior to Judah's captivity in Babylon. So there, that's the doom that, that Joel is writing of, of, uh, of very much a fair warning, as, as I would call it. And the fair warning is a call for Judah to repent. And we're going to see that. We'll read it here in a moment. In that, we'll also find that as we repent, we'll read and see that the hope and the blessings of what God will restore. There is restoration. He writes a good deal of the physical restor restoration, but also as he closes out the book is the eternal hope and the eternal restoration. It, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's a book that, you know, I'm glad we're studying. It's my benefit more than anybody's that as I prepare, and I, I'm thankful for that. But I say that to say this, um, that's when it was written. Joel seems to just take up the pen and start writing. 
He's really not one that is in any particular lineage that we see. Uh, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. That's all we know about Joel. That's it. So we don't really have a lot to know about him other than his father was Pethuel. Um, it doesn't really have a time mark that we can say he's under certain kingship or um, any from that standpoint, but it is early written, and I can say that. Some people link it to the um, reign of Joash, but I don't see where that's there. I, I, I don't know where they get that, but, but scholars will say that he wrote during that time period. I will say it is early written. I'm certain of that. You can see that you know his lineage is the son of Pethuel. His name um, literally is Jehovah is God. Joel means Jehovah is God. And that's the evidence of what he writes. Everything that we see that Joel writes of is by direction of God is doing this for good reason. God led the doom. He called the repentance. He judged them. He will judge us. And that's what we see throughout this book. Everything is God, Jehovah, is God. So that's what his name means. So let's read the first chapter, because you'll see immediately what I'm talking about. Um, just the first, we'll just read chapter 1 to start with. And the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. Tell your children, tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer, wor wor palmer worm hath left, the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. I'm going to stop there and just explain that. That's the life cycle of the locust. He just basically describes the life cycle of the larvae and the canker worm and the locust. The swarm, the swarm that came in and destroyed utterly everything that we're reading of here um, decimated D Judah and decimated everything that they possibly had in terms of their livelihoods, um, provision, um, everything. So just be mindful, that verse that describes the life cycle, a lot of people will say, well, this was talking about an army of people. It's, I don't believe that to be the case. I believe that to be literally this was a swarm of locusts that came through. We've been privileged not to really know what a swarm of locusts really is, but as it was, this army, as it's in verse 6, literally came through and decimated them physically, but the call is to come to repentance. An army does come in Babylon later on, but this is a call to repentance. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten, and what the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten, and what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. So it uses locusts in every yeah. verse. Yeah, yeah. So it is. It's a life cycle. And as we'll see here later in verse 6, um, the description of what it did, uh, it's true. Very, very much this is a, a swarm that just, er, there was nothing left after they came through that was green. But notice in verse 5, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep. And howl all ye drinkers of the wine because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Quite literally, stripped the bark off the tree. 
not only ate everything that was green, but stripped the bark. So olives didn't grow, trees, anything green. The locusts ate it and then debarked the tree. I'm glad I'm not a farmer because I'd probably be not a very good one. Um, but I'm just saying, imagine being a farmer and having that decimation, the frustration. I mean, the patience of where you go from there. Now, these are trees. How long does it take to get a, a, a crop of olives and uh, fruit? Years. Years of work laid waste. They, they, uh, they ate it completely clean. Lament is at verse 8. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, the trees of the field are withered because the joy withereth away from the sons of men. I'll stop there. That's the doom. Uh, that's the physical description of this army of locusts that came through. There's nothing left. They had no crops coming out nothing to physically sustain themselves on that's when it you know describes all the trees are gone imagine being in that state you know physically now guided by god god sent this to them and then he gets into the verse 13 to follow gird yourselves and lament ye priests howl ye ministers of the altar come lie all night in sackcloth ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. They didn't have anything there to offer. There's nothing, they couldn't worship properly and sacrifice to their God because there was nothing, they had nothing to offer. It was gone. It's kind of unique from the standpoint, and it's kind of one of the points with what happened in 70, 70 A.D., the utter destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. was that the Jews could no longer physically worship any longer. Here, similar, for this time period, they didn't have anything in the fields to bring in to have anything to offer in sacrifice. They had nothing. So that's why the lamenting is happening. The ministers of the altar, there's nothing to even give back to God. So their worship was ineffectual. They didn't have any. Notice in verse 14, and this is the cry that he starts to, uh, Joel starts to make. <clears throat> Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, we're going to come back to verse 14. I'll read the remaining part of the book, the chapter here. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. It is not the meat cut off before your eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of your God. The seed is rotten under the clods. The garners are laid way desolate, I'm sorry. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry for the fire that devoureth the pasture of the wilderness, the flame that hath burned the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee for the rivers of waters are dried up and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Now, I said it starts off in gloom and doom. 
is there anything there that we can point to to say, that sounds like a pretty good day in my book. Anything at all that we can point to? No. It's doom, gloom. He hopefully did, right? <laughs> if that doesn't, if that doesn't get their attention, what will? When things aren't going our way, when, when there are struggles in life, how is our attitude about it? How, how do we handle it? Right, right. So let's go back to 14, because that's what I think this is how we should handle it. I think that's the, the point to be taken away. Sanctify ye a fast. Now, sanctify is what? Set yourself apart. Now, the unique thing about Joel is Joel never really points to the sin of Israel and Judah. But what was the sin of Israel and Judah at this time? Yes? What? Idolatry. Idolatry. He doesn't point to it, but what had brought them to this point? Well, contemporary other prophets that were writing also, very clearly, they're idolatry. They were idolatrous. What the Lord had sent them in this swarm of locusts and totally brought their attention to relying on God, because that would bring you to a point where you'd realize, we've messed up. So it's a call to repentance, and the, the, the point in 14 is, Set yourself apart. Well, what were they to set themselves apart from? Their disobedience of what they had done. They had left the Lord. They had pulled in all these idols, and idolatry and worship to the idols was what they were sinning, and they had left. And it's, a, it's an evident point that that false idol is not your God. Jehovah, your God, is your God. Not only can he take it away, as we'll see later on, he can restore. And so that's the pendulum we'll see swing through Joel here. Sanctify ye a fast. What was the purpose of a fast? Prayer, dedication, meditation, repentance, Repentance. It would have been pretty easy to fast with this kind of condition, truthfully. They had nothing. Nothing. So their fasting would have been what? So they're typically what it, you, when you, we should fast, by the way. There's plenty of New Testament scripture spoken about our fasting. And our fasting is giving up physical goodness that we have, putting in order our spiritual lives, foregoing. If we can master that which is physical, we can hopefully get to the point where we're able to be more spiritual, spiritually competent. And so the fast brings us to that point of control and discipline and... and uh, being able to put those things in order in our lives, not just slothfulness, not just giving in to every uh, uh, impulse that we have, but controlling those things and putting those things in order. Rick? Uh, Dan, I'd kind of back up a little bit. The significance I see in, in understanding what's going on in Job's world is they'd already witnessed the Assyrian, and I don't think Joel was talking about the northern ten tribes. He's talking about Judah. Yes. There's a couple of reasons for that, but yep. you know, he mentions, and I, you may have said this, and I was, mine was elsewhere, but in verse 6, he gives this identity that helps us to understand a little bit about the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, for a nation has come up against my land. 
Well, as we know, Babylon's invasion was over a period of years. Mm-hmm. And uh, Judah had a chance to repent at the first invasion, yep. but they didn't. And it ultimately led to the final destruction, like you pointed out, the destruction of the temple. Yep. But it's interesting, too, tying that with the fact that he talks about the, the priests. Yep. Well, of course, Jerusalem was where the priests were. Judah was still um, in the early stages. The temple was still there, mm-hmm. although we know that the, you know, they were carrying people away. They were carrying things out of the temple. And so, you know, as you look at what he's describing here, what you've been doing is that um, these people, uh, they could have and should have really come to grips with what was going on when, like when you look down there for, um, he says, the nations come against my land, verse 6, chapter 1, strong and without number, and then the teeth are the teeth of a lion. Well, who wants to mess with the teeth of a lion? No, nobody does. And his fangs of a fierce lion, he has laid waste my vine, he's ruined my tree. I mean, it is destruction that's on top of them, and... Uh, that kind of brings us up to where you're at. I didn't want yeah, to interrupt no, where you're I at. Appreciate I just wanted that. to add that because yeah. sometimes, you know, you were talking about we don't really know when this book was written and so forth. Well, we don't, but, but we've got a couple identifying factors there that are important. The nation against them and then the fact that the priests were active. Yes, and that's time-wise. It was prior to the Babylonian captivity, the warning of the Babylonian captivity in and I didn't say, yeah, it's between the Assyrian, but, but yeah, that's a good point uh, from that standpoint in time. Who should have, and of all the people that should have known, who should have known? The priests. And it's a redundant issue throughout, you know, Israel's and Judah's um, failings but the priests were not ever carrying out their duties truly. I mean, there were some that did, but the, the majority as Israel went into idolatry and left, and we're, we'll see it especially in Malachi later on, but especially the priests were not carrying out their duties of warning, of reading, of scripture, of teaching, of carrying out their priestly duties. And it's mentioned here, uh, but especially all of it, Israel and all of Judah, should have known this, but but nonetheless, the priests especially of all. But uh, appreciate that very much. So the call is in verse 14 then, to set yourself apart. Yeah. It, in Matthew, it talks about fasting, mm-hmm. and it doesn't say if you fast, no. it says when, when. you fast. Yeah. Yep. And in the fourth chapter, it talks about when Jesus fasted 40 days and then went up against, you know, the devil tempted him at that time. And it says that he was hungry after 40 days, but he was spiritually strong mm-hmm. because he was able to, to combat the devil. Mm-hmm. And fasting for us is to be that same concept. When we fast, it's to make us not physically strong, but spiritually strong. Right. Right, it's not physical really at all. Um, but yeah, that's what they're called to do. Fast, set yourself apart. Call a solemn assembly. Now he's gonna mention this again, but I wanna go to this point because we just had a couple of excellent lessons on ecclesia. Now this is obviously in the Hebrew and the word is clearly different, but contextually when you look at this, was there any eligibility here for just some of you to come to this assembly? No. Call a solemn assembly. Notice that. Solemnly. What's something that's solemn when we say the word solemn? What's another word we can say instead of solemn? Sacred. A sacred assembly. What else? Serious. morning type situation like a mm-hmm. funeral mm-hmm. he mentions you know, that we, later yeah we come we come into yeah. a solemn yeah 
So it's mm -hmm. serious. This isn't haphazard. This isn't just, well, if you really want to, you know, if at least 20% of you guys show up, that would probably be plenty. That's not it. And this is a solemn assembly because repentance was at hand. And it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Wasn't talking about individual repentance here. He's talking a nation, a nation of people. Now, we can do this individually. Certainly, we need to. But there are times as a nation that it's failed. This is a assembly of the people of the nation come together because you need to set yourself apart from where you're at. You need to fast. You need to come together. All, as he says, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of your Lord and cry unto the Lord. The cry being what? Hmm? Repent. Repent. Because he says, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. He says this three times in the book. This, this day of the Lord, he uses it twice, and then the third one is the terrible day of the Lord, which is prospectively forward from here. But alas, the day of the Lord, it's the deliverance that was going to come if they didn't. The day of the Lord. They had been delivered to Assyria. They would be delivered to Babylon. You would think that they would get their attention when they lose everything that they've got, that they, as a people, would repent and be saying, yeah, we've messed up. But they don't. They keep going back. They keep going back. And they keep going back. Now, not to beat up on them, do we do that ourselves? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. The call for sanctifying ourselves, the call for calling upon the Lord, the call for us to repent, and you'd think that the first time that I mess up, that, that would be it, but is that the only time I mess up? Unfortunately, too often. And I go back and I do things I know either I shouldn't do or I don't do the things I should be doing. So I'm not just beating up on Israel, but we can all take the lesson from them. And I'll say Judah. It should, it, this is Judah, and I keep saying Israel encompassing Judah, but it's Judah that he's speaking of here. The day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. They could and would be delivered to the Babylonians soon. And this call for repentance is at hand. Any points through chapter 1. We kind of rushed through that, but... On fasting, and he talks about a Pharisee and a tax collector. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisee says, I am proud, Lord, that I'm not like other men. Mm -hmm. And then the he says, I fast twice a week. Mm -hmm. Well, like that was a, an item of virtue, but then the tax collector just smote himself. He said, I'm a sinner, Lord. Forgive me because I'm a sinner. So that's the kind of attitude that fasting should bring us to is that uh, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so we all stand in need of his forgiveness regardless of who you are. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. You know, uh, this time that they're going through, we have seen this. Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, quite a few years ago, Ethiopia was, was uh, in a severe drought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also they had a locust swarm that come upon that land in that area. And that's when we seen pictures that were coming across our screen that, that make you cry. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the cry out to, you know, uh, that they had just was, you know, we, we need to understand that, how bad that was yeah. and how bad it could be for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Dan, also, 
You know, the attitude and disposition of this people never did change. Yes. You know, when uh, I'm thinking about martyr, when a martyr Stephen, you know, finally got to the point, he just told him, you know, you're just like your fathers were, you haven't changed at all. Mm -hmm. Stiff neck, uncircumcised in the heart. <clears throat> in other words, that attitude and disposition is what brought a, an end to the Jewish nation in AD 70. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true, very good point. Rick? Just real quick, I, I wanted to mention, as you, as you look at uh, verse 16, he, he says, is, is not the food cut off before our eyes? There's going to be an effect upon those people because the food supply, obviously, with it, the locusts, yeah. yep. which the, uh, or thinking of the nations, of course, the nations were often described as locust uh, invasion. But one of the things that, that uh, really kind of is sad and it makes you, you kind of heart, not only for the people, but look at verse 18, how the animals groan. I know. I mean, it's hard to look at it at a starving human being for sure, but it's even hard for me to, to see a horse or a cow standing out in a field where there's no grass and you can see through its bones. Mm -hmm. Well, it was going to be, the people were not, were not going to be eating and neither were the animals. And so they had to watch those animals die. And the worst part of it is there wasn't much to eat on them. Uh, they were going to be suffering as well. And, uh, you know, he describes it as the herd is restless because they have no pasture. Even the sheep, sheep suffer punishment. Yeah. Um, that's something, too, they had to experience and live with, literally, yep. with this being uh, invaded. Um, and so as you think about all the ramifications, and, and my point of all this is, is that sin has its consequences that affect more than just us. Right. And that's the point I was going to bring us to. I thought I was going to get through this in two weeks, but evidently not. But yeah, does sin have its consequences in our lives? Absolutely right. Does sin only affect me? No, it doesn't. <laughs> it affects a lot of people. When I do something as an individual, the people around me, it affects them. As a nation, the sin of a nation, who does it affect? It's widespread consequence. And you're right. I mean, you can't help but to pity the cattle. They didn't do anything wrong. They're just cattle. The sheep. They're just sheep. But the sin of a nation influenced all of creation, essentially. And from that standpoint, the, the pity's there. Anything else? No man lives and dies to himself. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. In the flood, because if you think about it, except for Noah and his family, mm -hmm. everything was destroyed because it was all evil. Yep. Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, and it's a repeating pattern, as, as Bob well said. It, it's perplexing to me, and I'll say, I, I mess up, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this from the standpoint of not understanding. You would think that the eight people, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, their wives, would have just seen the flood, just seen the mighty hand of God. And then what do they do? They had seen it. And then they turned. And they, we find Noah as a drunkard. And you just scratch your head wondering, how does that happen that way? But again, when we look at our own lives, we turn. We go back. We don't have the discipline sometimes that we should. We follow an impulse that we shouldn't. We do the things that we shouldn't. We don't do the good that we're supposed to do when we know I need to do this and I don't do it. I mean, you go into the things of our lives that we turn ourselves and do. Yep. Yeah. 
of uh, humanity, we, we take the law for granted. So he tell us what to do, how to do it, and they say, like, oh, I know better than that. Yeah. And when we need it, yeah, Lord, where are you? Why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. But yet, when we doing fine, I don't need the Lord, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do that. Thank you. And I think Israel did that to some extent. They knew where God was at. They kept leaning on it. Every time something went wrong, they would call on, Oh, remember me? Jacob, our father? Father Abraham? They would go back to the co covenant. They would go back and remind God, Remember? And they knew where he was at, but they would go back. You're right. Only when they needed him. Then they would turn. And the times, and, and it's countless numbers of times, and unfortunately we see that across this span of time. But I will say, read chapter 2 for next week. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I really want to get into, you know, when we get down to... Uh, so we'll say that this is Joel, and Joel speaks uh, down to verse 12 of chapter 2 and then the Lord speaks after that so we'll continue on um, in a couple of weeks um, we're going to be gone next week so uh, but in a couple of weeks read that and then what I'd really like to spend some time on when we get there is is the call to repentance and what what that is and, and we have a beautiful description of repentance and what that requirement was um, in verse 12. Um, so look at verse 12 through about 14, 12 through 14. A beautiful description of repentance um, there. But anything else, I just... I'm, not, I'm at a spot here. It's probably a good stopping spot, and then we'll come back to that in a couple of weeks. Yep. Somebody else, or is their life affecting me? I, I think this has been a mindset of all humanity because it is in the book for whom the bell toll. He said, "Ask not if I'm diminished by the death of mankind." For I'm diminished by the death of all men, as not then for whom the bell tolls, for it tolls for thee. Yeah. So we, we have a mindset that you know, we're all affected. <coughs> if something happens to you, it, you know, adversely it would affect me. Yeah. And if something happens to me, it would affect you. So we're in the brotherhood of man, mm -hmm. and we're, we're striving to let man see that going away from God, this what Joel's talking about. You go exactly. away from God, here's what happens. Yep. You stay with God, there's great blessings and great peace yep. in the family of God and, and among God's people. And that's where we're going in chapter 2. It's, it's the restoration that God promises, and we'll see that, but it's based on repentance, and you're right. You know, unfortunately, sometimes when we sin, we just like to think it didn't affect anybody else but me. Ah, it's just in my closet. I'll just close my closet door and just keep those things in that closet. It's not the way it works. Not at all. Talk yeah. about people getting affected. Yeah. The whole family. The whole families. And we see that every week. Every week. And then uh, uh, outside of even that, that we know of, you know, within... Well, sometimes the whole town. I mean, we've seen murders happen, and the whole town is on edge. It affects people. But it is um, that. But I say that to say this. Uh, a beautiful description of repentance. Um, we'll go on from there and see in the restoration that can be had based on that, not only physically but spiritually. Uh, then we'll go from there. So appreciate all the good comments and uh, observations.